I'm John Solis. I'm a chiropractic neurologist. I've been in private practice in Rhode Island for just over 25 years. And while I don't treat epilepsy directly, the reason why Jesse and Linda allowed me the privilege of speaking here today is because some of the clinicians are already alluded to the fact that there is some overlap here. There are children on the autism spectrum uh, have epilepsy more than in the general population. Even with ADHD, we'll see that a higher percentage of children will have seizures with ADHD and certainly with autism spectrum disorders. I'm specializing in a very cutting edge, uh, brain-based, uh, non-pharmaceutical treatment of ADHD, dyslexia, other learning disabilities, and certainly things on the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this method was developed by The author of Disconnected Kids and his sequel, Reconnected Kids, Dr. Robert Melillo, who is a world-renowned chiropractic neurologist, researcher, and professor. His latest book, which is on prevention of autism, just came out December 31st. I had the good fortune of training, doing a one-year postdoctoral training under Dr. Melillo for one year in Boston, and I'm happy to bring that to my practice and to uh, the state of uh, Rhode Island. Now, currently, there are really only a few types of disorders that are technically on the autism spectrum disorder. There's a child disintegration syndrome disorder, Asperger's, which is probably being taken off the list because they're so high functioning. Certainly classical autism, pervasive development disorder, which pretty much covers the entire umbrella, but they may not fit into one little uh, nice neat category. And Rett syndrome, which is an inherited syndrome, almost totally in females and much more unusual. The reason I have here in parentheses ADHD, OCDs, Oppositional Defiance Disorder, Dyslexia and Tourette's, which is a tick disorder, is because these all have one common denominator. It's what is now known as functional disconnect syndrome or hemispheric delay. What we mean by that is that we have inappropriate long-range connections between the left and right side of the brain. The brain is not damaged per se, but what is happening is that electrically we're not communicating as we should from the right side of the brain to the left and vice versa. The majority of the fibers that cross the corpus callosum, which is that little bridge between the hemispheres, are inhibitory in nature. So that the right sort of puts the brakes on the left, the left sort of puts the brakes on the right, so that we hopefully have a nice even balance. And I'm taking artistic license here, the brain's not severed per se, but we have an imbalance where we're not communicating properly between the two hemispheres. Interestingly, what often happens with this is that we may be overwired synaptically in one part of the brain. So you may have someone with ADHD, and if it's true ADHD, it's primarily a right hemisphere issue, and, but they may be very heavily wired in their left hemisphere. They may have been an early word reader, have good phonological awareness, good decoding for reading, and they also may be your basic math wins, very gifted in math calculations, but perhaps poor reading comprehension, which is really more of a right brain skill. This is what we call unevenness of skills. So the common denominator of all these things, uh, Dr. Uh, Gaitanis illustrated very effectively before, the petals of the flower versus the roots. So in hemispheric integration, while the symptoms or behaviors are like the petals of the flower, rather than just treating the symptoms, Rather than just doing the same thing to everyone to ramp up the whole brain, what we do in hemispheric integration is through a, a, a long examination in history is to determine what part of the right brain not, is not firing right, what issues do we have in the left brain because it's never totally pure, and then treatment plans are designed specifically to that child or adult so that we actually even out the communication between the two sides of the brain. And there are a lot of, there's a lot, there are a lot of references for this. I'm not speaking out of term. This is in the you know, medically indexed uh, literature. It's backed up by a lot of research. It's gaining popularity. Again, we have this unevenness of skills, academic problems, poor social skills. Why do kids on the autism spectrum tend to not make much eye contact, not have what we call theory of mind, where we can tell by the inflection in someone's voice, uh, the tone of voice, what we call prosody? Why is it they don't really get social cues? Why are they not socially uh, skilled? because that's very much a right brain function. And when that's weak, we're not very good socially. Um, an extreme example would be an autistic savant that may have an incredible superhuman ability to do math calculations or something else that's visual. 
They're very heavily wired in that one area, but we don't have good communication between left and right side. Typically in autism, we find that the corpus callosum, that little bridge, is actually smaller than it should be. Is it damaged? No, it's like a muscle. When we don't fire it enough, it doesn't hypertrophy. We don't have enough synaptogenesis. Uh, so through neuroplasticity, because the majority of these things that we now know are not genetic, we can make exciting changes uh, by stimulating the brain non-pharmaceutically to have great results. We know there's a preponderance of males, four to one, in autism, six to one in ADHD. And we think now that the reason is that males tend to have a little bit, they tend to be a little more right brain to begin with. Females a little bit more left brain, but you women are better at pulling from both sides. You multitask better than we guys do. And we now know the neurological reasons for that. There is a reason. So males are generally more uh, dependent on their right brain. And if we have a, a decrease in the neurotransmitter dopamine during pregnancy in utero, there are less receptors for dopamine in the right side of the brain than on the left side of the brain. So if you're male and you're more dependent on that right brain, you have less receptors, the brain in the male is less forgiving uh, for various dips that can occur hormonally during gestation. And we now feel that that is the reason why males are much more affected than females in ADHD and autism. So what's the cause? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? Is it immunization? The debate goes on. As far as immunizations, the jury's really not out on that anymore. That has pretty much been put to rest. Just a few years back, someone tried to make immunizations, childhood immunizations, the smoking gun. And uh, Dr. Malula himself was interviewed when that was going on. Interestingly, the gentleman who pioneered the project, pioneered the paper, fudged the results, unfortunately. The other gentleman that helped co-author the paper were so incensed that they had their names removed from the paper. So we pretty much put that to rest that immunizations very, very seldom are the smoking gun. What about genetics? Well, so far, the last thing I read in the literature is that they've identified approximately 28 bad genes in autism, but they seem to only appear in about 1% of cases. And there's an inescapable universal truth. There's no such thing as a genetic epidemic. You cannot go from one out of 10,000 in the autism spectrum 20 years ago to one out of 88 as of last, last year. Now, a lot of people said, well, we're recognizing it more. There's expanded diagnostic criteria. They've done studies that now show that approximately 25% of this increase is due to greater awareness and expanded diagnostic criteria, that we're diagnosing it better, we're recognizing it earlier, and so on. That's true. The other 75% is a true increase, but you can't get a genetic epidemic that would just soar off the charts uh, to that degree. So what we now know is that a lot of what's driving this is environmental. So the, the buzzword these days is epigenetics. And epigenetics, that term has been around for about 20 years. It's been getting a lot more attention since about the year 2000. And uh, this was a, this is the cover of Time Magazine just a couple of years ago about epigenetics, why your DNA isn't your destiny. Sometimes DNA is our destiny. So if I have trisomy 21, I'm going to be, I'm going to have Down syndrome. There's no escaping that. But in these disorders, the genetics are the least of it. So with epigenetics, we're looking at the fact that parents may have a bit of a trait. And if they have poor lifestyle, if they're overweight, bad diet, they spend too much time with technology, which really ramps up your left brain. If, they're left, if their cognitive style, as we call it, is that they're more of a left brain person, and if they have a bad lifestyle, they can actually pass on genes to their children in a dormant, turned off state. Does that mean the DNA is damaged? No. It's not the genome, it's the expression of the gene. And now through epigenetics, in fact, a couple of gentlemen just a few months ago won the Nobel Peace Prize for the research in epigenetics. This is very real stuff and it's exciting. And we thank God that the majority of these disorders are not because of DNA's DNA. If they were, we would not be getting the phenomenal results that we're getting in hemispheric integration. So we're changing diet, we're changing stimulation of the brain, in order to enhance or reorchestrate the connection, the, uh, the expression of genes that are responsible for brain development. So through epigenetics, we're making exciting changes. What builds brains? Movement. More than light, sound, light touch, deep touch, all those things help build a brain. 
But we now know that movement, more than anything, builds the brain. In fact, they found that running, we don't know exactly why only running, running actually has been shown to produce new neurons in the central nervous system, something that we thought before was uh, impossible. That has been shown. And when that was shown to be, all of the researchers in that project took up, took up running. And so, uh, in fact, in Runner's World, a few months ago, a magazine that I subscribed to because I'm a runner myself, it had a runner with Einstein's head on it saying, running will make you smarter. So how do we build a brain? When we're born, we don't really have much of the cerebral cortex. We're like this primitive little brain stem, and the baby pees and poops and eats and just sort of makes these little amphibian-like movements. We're just a primitive brain stem. Why do we not have much of a brain? It's simple. We'd never get out of mom's birth canal. We'd never get out of the pelvis. So that's what gets us there. And then as we start to get stimulation with touch, light, and sound, and we start to move, we have this upward trajectory, and we build a brain from the bottom up. And then we have synaptogenesis. We have neurons or nerve cells that are branching out to their neighbors, and we're strengthening pathways, what we call neuroplasticity. In fact, even in adults, we've now found that if we learn a new skill, let's say we take up music, and as we learn a new skill, we can see changes in gray matter of the brain within two hours of learning a new skill. So in hemispheric integration, besides promoting movement, we're also working in a way that will promote what we call neuroplasticity in the brain. That if something has gone wrong in early development, the brain is pretty forgiving. And if we intervene at a certain time and give the brain precisely what it needs, we're seeing incredible changes in ADHD, uh, learning disabilities, and on the autism spectrum disorder. So why is the brain so unique in humans? We have a bird's eye view here, looking at the brain from the top. Well, we have a right brain and a left brain. More than any other species on the planet, the brain in humans is more segregated than any other. For example, sharks never sleep. Why? Their right and left brains do the same thing. So one side shuts down while the other one works, and the shark stays awake and never has to sleep. In humans, more than any other species on the planet, we have a lot of segregation of the right and left brain doing pretty much totally different things. Now, if we have a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, can we sort of rewire through neuroplasticity and take some functions over? Yeah, thankfully we can. But if that's not the scenario, we're very segregated. So what makes us so much more uh, intelligent than any other creature on Earth? It's because of this specialization. Now some people say, well, it's because of our brain size, our brain ratio. We have a bigger brain to body ratio. There are some rodents and birds that have a bigger brain to body ratio than we do. So it's not the size of the brain. What happens in the human brain is that when things are working well, we, can, we have a phenomenal ability to pull from our left brain and our right brain and bind information very quickly, what we call temporal coherence, in nanoseconds. And that gives us now an ex exponential leap in intelligence. Because it's a fact that we share about 99% of the genome of chimpanzees and apes. So we have about the same genome. We only differ a little bit. So it's not even our genome or our gene structure. So this is our <laughs> gene pool, folks. So it's not the gene pool that we share with them. It is the ability to time and bind information that makes us so incredibly intelligent. But it's a double-edged sword. When something goes wrong in early development, we didn't crawl. We crawled wrong. We didn't roll over. Something went on in early development where the pediatrician might say, oh, don't worry about it. The new information is, yes, worry about it. Dr. Miller's latest book on autism is probably the only one that's been written that gives us every red flag, including prior to conception in parents, every possible thing that we could do to prevent autism. Because most of it is not genetic, we can make changes even before conception. Right now, we're working primarily with kids and adults with the damage is already done. So in hemisphericity, in order to treat the brain the right way, because this ability to pull information, if there's a desynchronization of the two sides of the brain, it's a bad deal. Because now we can't pull information and bind it in time, what we call temporal coherence, in a way that we should. We get this unevenness of skills, and we get this, these sensory processing imbalances in the brain. So to understand how it works and to be able to implement it, it's essential that we understand what the left and right brains do. And I don't have the time today to go through this whole list, but this just gives us a little bit of an overview 
Uh, the left brain, uh, we see here a small picture. What does that mean? That's the person that's very OCD, very, can see a speck of paper or a tiny spot on someone's tie a half a mile away, and most of us wouldn't be cognizant of it. Very, very detailed, what we call a left brain person. The right brain is more about the big picture, being able to understand the gist of a story, the gist of a joke, comprehension. Verbal communication is left hemisphere, right hemisphere is nonverbal communication. Small muscle controls into the domain of the left brain. Occupational therapists tend to work with small, uh, with fine motor skills. Physical therapists tend to work more with uh, large muscle control. And that's more in the domain of the right hemisphere. Why do most kids I see on the autism spectrum, and also with ADHD, have weak postural muscles of the neck and back? I'll ask them to do bridges in the prone and supine position, and they're shaking and they're giving out. Right brain. Studies have shown that even if you just strengthen the postural muscles of the neck and back and improve motor skills, the skills in the right brain start to ramp up. Now, if we combine that with the appropriate sensory stimulation and do it in the right combination, now we really get great results. Left hemisphere is about word reading, decoding, being able to predict the next word, phonological awareness, being able to use language and be able to interpret sounds properly. So when we have a left hemisphere defect, what do we get? usually dyslexia, which is more than just transposing or reversing numbers and words. Some dyslexics don't have it, but it's about being able to use language, and that's pretty much a left brain domain. And what we found is when they do EEGs, brain waves, they find differences on the left side of the brain in a dyslexic or someone with dyscalculia, someone who has challenges with math calculations. If it's true ADHD or autism spectrum, we see those changes brainwave-wise in the right hemisphere. On a traditional MRI, there usually not too many differences, perhaps smaller circumference of the brain, and maybe some increase in white matter and autism, but the brain isn't really damaged. But however, with tractography, a special type of MRI, we can show left and right brain and see differences in the size via color enhancement of tracts in the left versus the right side of the brain, whether it's dyslexia or ADHD or autism. So all this is being proven out now by, by imaging and also electrophysiological testing uh, of the brain. Tactile processing, light touch. Why do a lot of kids on the spectrum, they can't stand short tags, they can't stand long sleeves, they don't want clothing on them? Because when the left brain is tempered by the right, my light touch sense is out of control. It's not tempered. I had a woman last summer who brought her daughter to me and that was one of her main complaints. She said, I pull my hair out to get her out the door to school because we have to put five different things on so it's something that she can tolerate for the day. Within one month, she said, what a God said. We don't have this oddity, this clothing issue uh, anymore. Right, right brain is more about deep touch. Left brain is about being very familiar, liking routine. I'm kind of a left brain person. My wife will tell you, I like routine. I don't like anybody messing with my routine. I'm a little OCD, but not enough that it's limiting in life. But we see some people where they are so into their routine, God forbid you shake up their routine. Recently I had a uh, lady bring in her 12-year-old son who's on the spectrum. She said, my husband went and bought a new truck. It's a different color. And when he saw that dad and I had a white truck, he had a meltdown because it's not the same color. If they go to stop and shop, and now she decides to go to Dave's market instead. The kid has a meltdown because they went to a different market. Why? Right brain, left brain likes familiarity. When right brain is delayed as it is in autism, doesn't temper the left side, we like routine too much. Now we're out of control. I had this young lady, a 20-year-old young lady, um, this past year in my office uh, who has some issues. Her OCDs are so bad that one morning she noticed when she was leaving for school her shoes weren't lined up in her closet. She went to class. When she got out of class, she drove a half an hour home to line up the shoes and then go back to school for her next class. So this is where these OCDs are getting out of hand. This also has a lot of implications for anxiety. We've had some wonderful breakthroughs with people with a dramatic reduction in their anxiety by resynchronizing the connections between left and right hemisphere. Left hemisphere is about uh, activating our immune system. The right hemisphere suppresses it. That's when we have an even balance. Why is it that a lot of kids on the spectrum have autoimmune things? They tend to have more 
rashes, eczema, psoriasis, they have a lot of autoimmune uh, problems. That's no coincidence. It's because their left brain is hypervigilant so the body attacks itself. Why do a lot of kids, and the majority of kids that I see on the spectrum, have terrible gut issues, gut dysbiosis, constipation and or diarrhea. They can't digest certain things. Why is that? Well, when the brain, or brain is out of sync, we now know that's what's called the brain-gut connection. And they cannot secrete enough enzymes at the right time to break down protein molecules. So these large protein molecules are floating around. About 60% of our immune system is in our intestinal tract. Now, the immune system recognizes those things as being far bodies and attacks them. So we have a messed up gut. The beauty of hemispheric integration is that when we integrate the hemispheres properly, the gut issues clear up. But in the meantime, it's useful to do blood testing to check for uh, not necessarily food allergies, but food sensitivities, which are more insidious. Uh, gluten's a big one. Soy, the casein in dairy products, and so on. And we find that when we do an elimination diet and get rid of those, we get better behavior, better function. But the beauty is if we're successful in what we do, no more gut issue. So it's not coincidence. It's because of our differences in our left and right brain. So in hemispheric integration, we're actually trying to balance the fire you see between the left and right brain. Now, I don't want to belabor this, but one huge aspect of what we do are what are called primitive reflexes. What are primitive reflexes or infantile reflexes? They start developing more in, more in the womb, okay, in utero. Primitive reflexes assist us in certain primitive movements. They also assist us in getting out of the birth canal if we're a vaginal birth. Some of the kids I see had a C-section. We were born by a C-section. Why can that sometimes be a problem? Because we don't engage certain neck reflexes getting out of the birth canal, and then we retain these reflexes when we shouldn't. This is just a small list of primitive reflexes. The majority of these are gone when we're about six months old, maybe nine months old. The last one to go is Babinski, which is on the foot, gone by the time we're about one year old. I'm finding children and adults that have, some of them are littered with primitive reflexes that should have been gone well before the first year of life. Why is this important? This is getting a lot of attention now. This means that we have an immaturity problem. Something went wrong in early brain development where our higher centers in the cerebral cortex did not come down and say, okay, we're done. We're inhibiting new brainstem reflexes. You served us when we needed you. We're done. We're moving on to maturity. They're retained. When we get rid of these or inhibit these reflexes through motor integration exercises, we get remarkable changes in, in brain maturity. This is what we call bottom-up approach. So the top-down approach, occupational therapy, PT, tutoring, remedial reading, whatever it is, now we get greater results. Speech therapy, why? You have a brain that absorbs it, that gets it, because you've rewired bottom-up so the top-down approach has better results. The spinal glottic reflex, interestingly, is oftentimes correlated with bedwetting. If we can get rid of that reflex uh, on this paraspinal muscle of the back, many times we'll see bedwetting clear up. The asymmetrical and tonic, uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical tonic neck reflexes um, are one of the most common ones that I see. And when those persist, they found that they're correlated with academic problems. Amazing stuff. Uh, the Moreau reflex, or Moro, however you want to pronounce it, is very much hooked up uh, with anxiety and hyperkinesis being hyperactive. That's a star reflex. If you stand over an infant, I'm sure that <coughs> Dr. Yunus knows it, and you smack your hands, make a loud noise, the limbs fly out, the face becomes flushed, they become diaphoretic, they sweat, they cry, the pupils dilate, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in. Well, some people are retaining their moral reflex into adolescence and even into adulthood. And we've had some wonderful breakthroughs where we have remediated the moral reflex, gotten rid of it or inhibited it through motor integration exercises, and that's gone. I started treating a lady uh, last May, who just graduated from college, very intelligent young lady, ADHD and horrible anxiety, to the point that her mom, when she was going to school out of state, would call a local pizza parlor to deliver pizza to her room because she couldn't stand to go into the dining hall with the kids, almost like an agoraphobia, if you will. Her mother told me, I cannot believe the drop in my, my daughter's anxiety. Her focus and attention got better, it's helped with her ADHD and with her motivation, but the biggest drop has been in her anxiety. Why? We got rid of her moral reflex. 
She has no more Moreau reflex than her anxiety has brought. Now, does that work in every case of anxiety? No, we may need psych counseling too. But again, we rely a bottom up and our top down approach has a much greater effect. Primitive reflexes are going to get a lot of attention. This was a paper that came out by Nova, Nova Science Magazine in 2011. And we're finding that the persistence of primitive reflexes has a lot of implications in faulty brain development and this desynchronization or um, functional disconnect syndrome. One other thing that I want to touch on before I finish here is what's called mixed dominance or cross laterality. If everything is working properly, if I'm right handed, hopefully I prefer my right foot, my right eye, and my right ear. And more so with left brain delays than right brain delays, but even with right brain delays, the majority of kids or adults that I see that have this function disconnect syndrome have what we call mixed dominance across laterality. So let's say my right ear is dominant and my left eye is dominant, but I don't know that. And we find that out. Well, if we intervene at a young enough age and we can get that right eye to be on the same page with the right ear, this increases processing speed in the brain. So if sound enters my right ear, and it's going to end in my left temporal lobe, and I'm using my left eye primarily, that's my dominant eye, and it crosses to the right brain, I have to decusate and make one additional decusation of crossing over in the left hemisphere to get everything on the same page. And it may be nanoseconds, but why does that matter in the brain? Because it slows processing speed. And when we use eye patching or plugging of an ear, or hemifield glasses and redirecting light to one hemisphere, whatever we may need to do for that individual, because it's very individualized. And if we can get that other side to be on the same page, we have remarkable results. On my handout, you'll see that there are a couple of testimonials. The last one is by a gentleman who's had dyslexia all his life. He's 53 years old. Imagine him a young child. His reading has improved so much that he's actually going to be coming with me in April when I lecture to the North Kingstown School Department about his gains in reading in just a few months. Imagine a young child whose brain is developing as even more neuroplastic. So he had a left brain delay, and we found that his dominance uh, was crossed. That's basically what we do in hemispheric integration. Uh, we use light, we use sound. You'll find that uh, many people, when they have a brain delay, they don't smell on that side. Olfactory smell is the only sense that pretty much goes straight back in the brain and doesn't cross at the other senses. So in ADHD and in autism spectrum, so if we block the left nostril and put a fragrance down here that we know is specific for the right brain, some of these kids can't smell. You could have a cotton with an essential oil in their nose that can't smell. If you just keep triggering that and you wake up that part, you start to stimulate the brain. We now know what frequencies and what musical notes go to what side of the brain, thanks to research. So we have brain balanced music in our office where Parents can purchase either left or right hemisphere music, play it in the car, play it in the bedroom all night long. That's another way of, through without pharmaceuticals, firing up that side of the brain. This is very unique, it's very specific, and rather than accentuating the positives, as they've been doing for over 70 years, we don't do that. Because if you stimulate brain areas that are high functioning, we electrically suppress low functioning areas. It's called surround inhibition. We don't want that. So when we specifically fire up the negative areas, leaving the positive alone, that is why we're getting astronomical leaps academically and behaviorally in kids and adults. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Yes? What exactly, oh, say I bring my daughter in to see you. you know, she has ADHD, executive function, epilepsy. Like, where do you go from that? I, I see there's a lot of movement and exercise. I, I mean, I'm thinking, what else? Is there like a machines or I'm, we're trying to visualize As far it. as treatment wise? Yes. Okay, a lot of it has to do with the eyes. There are a lot of extraocular eye exercises. Uh, typically what we'll see in almost every case is that our pursuit movements, which are smooth movements of the eyes, and cicadic movements, which are quick movements, uh, are off. And what I'll do is I have an app on my phone called an OPK drum, optokinetic drum, and we'll play a pattern of alternating red and white or red and black stripes going by. And in the dyslexic, you'll probably see very little movement to the left brain and very good cicadic movements. Um, I'm sorry, these are pursuits. Very little movement to the left side and great movements to the right. Their cicadic movements, which are quick movements, typically they'll have an overshoot or an undershoot, what we call hypermetria or hypometria. They usually also have a bit of a subtle head tilt because one eye is off. 
That tells a lot about what's going on in the area of the brain called the cerebellum at the back of the brain, which is for balance and coordination and so on. So a lot of these have abnormal eye movements. That's why autistics don't make much eye contact. They can't because they have poor eye fixation. If they're high enough functioning that we can remediate that through extraocular uh, eye exercises, that in itself is part of it. If I see one pupil that is very, um, very weak, say I shine light in it, instead of constricting for 10 to 15 seconds, it blows right back up again on one side. We want to do some light therapy through hemifield glasses and stimulation with a pen light and so on to channel light to that side of the brain. And when we get that pupil to constrict for a longer period of time, that's one little tidbit that now brings up that side of the brain. Most people with a right brain delay can't cross their eyes. A lot of them, they can't do convergence. So we have eye exercise as a part of it. Uh, you'll find that most people with right hemisphere delay fall to their left side. They tend to fall on the left side where the cerebellum is off in the inner ear, and they tend to fall away from the bad hemisphere. So just doing proprioceptive exercises, balance, strengthening of neck and back musculature, and there are also a lot of sensory exercises. It could be touch, but only on one side of the body, and whether we're going to do light touch or deep touch. So when we combine a lot of these motor exercises, when we get rid of cross laterality, when we remediate primitive reflexes, and we change eye movements, we make tremendous changes in the brain. And when we couple that, if necessary, with a diet and environmental changes, we get great uh, advances. And another thing I want to mention, folks, is that one reason we feel that this thing is getting so out of control is because of um, technology. Kids are spending hours on computer games. I think I was born in 1956. We had no such thing. We're always running around, exploring our environment, skinning our knees, and having movement. Remember, movement builds brain. When we sit on our butt and gain weight and eat junk food, and we're doing a lot of technology, that's ramping up our left brain. They did a study at uh, Indiana University Medical School that during video games, there is no activity in the prefrontal cortex where we have cognition and executive functions. It just flat lines. So it's a bad deal. So we want to limit technology. That's another thing that we can do epigenetically so that we can improve brains because we're destroying brains with technology. The American Pediatric Association released a statement a couple years ago that no child should see a TV screen before age two, regardless of content, no TV. And we want to limit technology. And the obesity epidemic in children parallels the ADHD and autism uh, epidemic. It is no coincidence, it parallels, the studies show that. Any others? Yes? Does uh, a child have to have, one of your patients have to have a minimal cognitive functionality before hemispheric integration can be effective? A minimal? So, so it seems like some of these, and this might be better to take offline, but um, we're sitting here thinking like, wow, this is some amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. But our child is very low um, with her brain development. She's very functionally uh, behind. So I'm just wondering, is there, does, does someone have to be a certain, or um, it's level, level like, to, for yeah. you to be able you know, to You said like the music effect. notes, like, I don't know, could we ever like, you know, use some other part of the brain by trying to like, do musical notes that might spark a new neural pathway, you know? Sure. I'd want to have a look at her so I can determine if she has a hemispheric issue, is it more right or left, and then use the music. But I do work primarily with higher functioning okay. uh, autism, certainly a lot with ADHD, OCDs, Tourette's, etc. Yeah. Relatively high uh, functioning. Uh, in Dr. Malillo's program in the Brain Balance Centers, if they're low enough function, they have to go to pre-brain -brain balance first. And he's had some kids that, for instance, are autistic mutes, they don't talk. Mm -hmm. And he's gotten a few of them, that this happens all the time, that started talking spontaneously. Miraculous stuff. So yeah, primarily more high functioning, but if I determine that this is more of a right or left brain kid, then at least we could do some music, uh, etc. So I don't work with really low, low functioning autistics. It's, it's variable, but a little more on the high functioning age. Yes? My son is very high functioning with the epilepsy and sensory and all that. Okay. And now, for the last, I don't know, probably six months or so, he's complaining of double vision. So he's going for an eye exam. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if it's actually a right left brain thing where one eye maybe is, has become lazy or. Very possible. And and if he does have some autism spectrum type of issues going on, that is primarily right brain delay. And we find that convergence of the eyes is weak more in right brain deficits than in left brain deficits. 
Um, I would certainly follow through with that examination, see what they come up with. But typically, we've got a problem with, with um, extraocular muscles that may need to be strengthened. Um, you know, just want to make sure there's nothing else causing the diplopia or the other double vision. I'd follow through with that. Uh, but it might be worth something having me take a look at them. And we might be able to ramp them up. We usually can. Sure. Yes? Is there an age, an appropriate age, when you can start examining them? Would you not examine someone if they're, let's say, one, two years old? Or um, would you prefer examining someone when they're older? And Dr. Lula's brain battle centers, they, they usually start at age five. The youngest I've worked with is recently, I had, I had a set of twins that are not verbal, and uh, they're four. <coughs> and so I did as much of the exam as they would allow me to, because they're not terribly high functioning. I gave the parents the music and a few other things to work on. I said, let's revisit some things every six months, and as the boys grow, I can give you more tools uh, to work on. But generally, age five is a good starting point, and then up to about age 17, 18 are the best results. But as I mentioned, I had a breakthrough with a 53-year-old dyslexic recently. So Dr. Miller says it's never too late, but when people tell me, oh, my son is eight, 10, 12, I'm beautiful, great, bring them in, great age to work with. Because they can also understand more of the commands that I need to give them during the exam to see where their desynchronization might be. Do yes. you have therapy in your office? or are you... It's done at home. Done at home? Yeah, in about a week and a half or two, I give you a full report that you can share with a pediatrician. Uh, some of them have been used in IEP meetings in the school, and they're usually very well accepted because the report, was, I promise you, is like one you've never seen. It's very unique, thanks to Dr. Muller, not me. I learned from him. And the treatment plan is very individualized, and it's done primarily at home. Then we want to see the child maybe monthly for a few months, then we might go bi-monthly, recheck the primitive reflexes to see if they're inhibited and they're gone, check eye movements and so on, update with the parents, how's his behavior, how's his function, how are things going in school, etc. But it's primarily a home-based uh, treatment, and it works very well. Thank you so much for yeah. the time.